Welcome, friends and fiends of the pod. I'm your host, film critic and comedian Nate Wyckoff, reminding you to like, subscribe, and go to cultandclassicfilms.com, where you can purchase exclusive cult ultra-low-budget films from us. And you can also subscribe and have them delivered monthly at a big discount to your door every month. So don't miss out on that. And unlike Roddy Rowdy Piper here in They Live, you don't need special glasses to see these deals. All right, so please, thank you, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Cult and Classic. <laughs> Welcome, friends and fiends of the pod, to a new episode of Cult and Classic Films Podcast, the podcast where we bring you two thematically linked films, one mainstream and one cult, and talk about them both. This pairing that we're going to do part one of today is uh, full of movies that I really enjoy. Part one of Look Out Below. If I paused, it's because I forgot. Yes, I forget where I am sometimes, too. There's so much going on here at Cult and Classic Films Podcast, and it's all good. Uh, but we will get that out to you in the future. Okay, so Jeff Tucker is sharing files in the meeting. I don't know. I don't know what this is, Jeff. Anyway, I couldn't figure out how to share a file, so that's brilliant. All right, any who's it's <laughs> with us today. We have the return of original contributor Jeff Tucker. How are you doing, Jeff? Just muted. We're okay. off to a great fucking start. You know, we've been plagued by technical difficulties today. Um, it's all right. It's all right. Jeff will uh, Jeff will unmute once he learns how computers work. He's only an electrical engineer. Okay. You muted me, bud. I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> okay. I was waiting for you to unmute me. <laughs> uh, well, I can mute you, but I can't unmute you. It won't let me. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> You need oh, consent so to unmute. I thought you had like a server mute power or something. No, I don't. I can mute. I can't unmute. All right. Oh, well, okay, anyways. Everyone. I'm your host, film critic and comedian, Nate Wyckoff. We're talking about Tremors 1990 today as part one of our Look Out Below uh, series. Seriously, Tremors is a fun movie. Uh, we're going to talk about it. Maybe not everybody feels that way, but I certainly do. It is one of the early roles by Kevin Bacon, and there's some stuff to talk about there. Also stars Fred Ward, Victor Wong, um, Reba McIntyre, and Michael Gross, a whole bunch of great people. All right. As I said, longtime contributor Jeff Tucker is back with us. How are you doing, Jeff? All great. I've been, you know, cosmic for the last, you know, century. You know, time, time, uh, time, you know, flows a little different for me and uh, I've conquered I'll many say. alien species and I have, uh, you know, I've come back to you in your time of need. Is that a sex thing? You, you know, conquered many welcome. alien species? Uh, doesn't have to be, but oh, I, well. I sure made it. Uh, <laughs> it just makes me, for some reason, it makes me think of, remember, it was in one of the movies, the Dragon Ball Z movies that I don't think is canon anymore, where you meet a uh, vid- or who is it? It's Vegeta's brother, and he has a wife, and the wife is like a blob. It's like Nathan, it's like a totally. Are you making this shit up? Because I don't remember I any of this. No idea what you're talking. I'm about. not making this up. We will. You know what, everyone? If you know the answer to my my, or the, the, if you know what I'm talking about, go ahead and send us uh, a screenshot to info at cultandclassicfilms.com, oh, and we'll share I'm, it on our media accounts. Sure, there's some fucking DBZ nerd who knows. Well, of course. Um, if it's not us, it's kind of surprising. All right. We also have uh, the gentleman here who cannot keep his mouth PC, Tad Mastroianni. How are you doing, Tad? New pod who this. New pod who this. All right. So as you can tell, we're very comfortable today. And uh, I'm excited. So Tremors. This movie came out in 1990. And it has been played... Um, I think the official count is like 260 gazillion billion times on the sci-fi channel, TNT, USA, uh, many, many networks. The reason is, is it's a pretty um, entertaining, not very heavyweight, uh, practical effect laden science fiction film, uh, fr- kind of horror film that is PG-13. So it really hit that sweet spot of movies that could be played on TV over and over again, and you wouldn't have to force the kids out of the room. Um, people wouldn't complain that somebody said the F word before uh, 11 o'clock at night on uh, cable television, all that good stuff. As I said, Kevin Bacon is the lead in this, although it really is an ensemble cast. I mean, he's maybe got slightly the most screen focus, but everybody has their part in this movie, and there are a fair amount of folks. The movie takes place in the fictional town of uh, 
Perfection. Uh, perfection. Thank you. It, the reason my brain stopped there for me is because I just did a binge of every single Tremors film there is. I believe there's oh, eight right Lord. now. And uh, and then there's the TV series that ran for a couple of years. And then there was a TV pilot movie, which um, unfortunately was not picked up, but actually had Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward uh, in it. So it's kind of unfortunate to get picked up. But anyway, the movie series is still going. And I'll, I'll mention that later. Uh, some details. OK, it is in uh, perfection. This little town, I think it's in Nevada. Is that where it's supposed to be or in New Mexico? Some desert hellscape. It could have been filmed it's, outside my front door, actually. It's in the desert. Yeah. And it's and I love it. And uh, it's one of those ghost towns, except that there's like one tiny general store. And uh, and that's about it. Everybody has like kind of nothing little jobs, either farming or subsistence work or geology study, something like that. And so we've got this collection of characters, each who has their own little past. We have Michael Gross, who plays Bert with his wife, played by Reba McIntyre. Uh, Michael Gross is one of those names that uh, you may not you may not recognize the name right off the bat, but you would recognize his face 100 percent. He plays Bert Gummer, who is the lead in um, every sequel except for one and two. And he plays this crazy conservative um, prepper gun nut who is very lovable in the end. Uh, Reba McIntyre plays his wife. Um, she does not continue on through the series, obviously, because she's Reba McIntyre. Directed video is not quite her thing. We have uh, Charlotte Stewart, who plays uh, Nancy. The, uh, let's see, a lot of people in here. But Kevin Bacon plays Val, and Fred Ward plays his friend Earl. And they're sort of, I wouldn't say layabouts or drifters, um, but they're always trying to look for a way to get out of perfection, to get money, et cetera, because they do odd jobs all around and are just kind of slumming it in a way. And we have uh, also Victor Wong's character. Victor Wong, if you don't know who he is, you do know who he is and just don't know it. He was in... Um, uh, Big Trouble in Little China, and uh, that's really all I need to say. But he's been he's been acting since uh, since time immemorial. Uh, so he plays Walter Chang, who runs the general store. In the future iterations, uh, his family members run the chain. And uh, yeah, there's some other some other folks in here as well. Tom Woodruff Jr. plays the uh, the the monster character in this movie. Uh, there's probably several people that really do, but he's the only one credited. It is just an awesome weird setup where these people end up uh, being attacked by these giant underground worms that hunt by sound vibrations through the earth and they have little tongues that come out and snag people and pull them under or objects whatever they're fairly intelligent and seem to problem solve and uh these these folks have to sort of fend off an attack by i think four of them and so we we get various ones being picked off, various people getting picked off, and it's all practical effects. No 3D here, no early 90, 1990 uh, upsetting 3D to be seen. All right. So first, I'm going to go to you, Jeff. Jeff, had you seen Tremors before? Oh, of course. I turned on a television and had the sci-fi channel at some point in my lifetime. And um, this is a movie where, like, if you haven't seen this movie, why the fuck are you listening to this podcast? It, it's you need to remedy it. I mean, if you haven't seen it before, whether this or not you, you whether or not we oversell it, because here's the thing about it. I feel like there are movies. We know this. We know there are movies that are just incredible movies, and I don't want to watch them all the time because they're heavy or it's just too much of an investment. But I know they're fantastic. And then there's movies that are bad and they're a struggle to get through. There's, of course, movies that are bad movies that are also fun to watch. This is one of those movies that's not a bad movie, but it's also not a like you know, like a, a, a crowning achievement of cinema, but it is just very watchable. It's like, you can kind of pick it up. The reason why it was a perfect TV cable movie is because anytime you popped into it, you could just start watching it. It's one of those, you know, um, it's, it's like uh, for, for my wife's family, it's um, uh, the, the tornado film. How come my brain is not working today? There's just so much other stuff. Twister? There's so many things I could tell you. Huh? Twister. Twister? Correct. Yeah, yeah, Twister. The they one that's going to get a point. fucking sequel now? It, yep, the sequel. And I don't think it has any of the original characters or really has Holy anything to do with shit. it. But any who's it's, I'm sure there's a cameo here or there. Probably. All right. Tremors. So yeah, so Jeff, you've seen Tremors. Tad, obviously you saw Tremors as well. Do either of you remember the first time you saw Tremors or what you remembered about Tremors if you hadn't seen it recently? Yes, but Jeff can go first because you asked him first. I did. Uh, no, not really. I feel like it's, you know, like 
one of those things that you watch and then you forget and then you come back because i don't think there's anything really uh um you know groundbreaking about this like you mentioned earlier yeah. that you're you're not like you're not changed by this film <laughs> so it's like <laughs> i don't think it's, it's you're not taking anything with you so you're uh, saying this is like a solid b jeff uh i don't know I'll, I'll, i mean i'll make a further comment on that i'll i'll uh i'll let you tell your grand story of the first time you watched oh, yeah. this and how it was a <laughs> profound effect on you and how it oh, changed yeah. you Holy uh, shit. Just so that I mean, we can have a little conflict here. I I hate to disappoint everyone. That's not fucking happening. This is a this is a movie. All right. This is a movie. This movie actually is really important to my family. And I don't mean like it's ground like a, like a like Jeff saying, it's not groundbreaking. This is just one of those movies where um the machine for 30 years, and I mean the media machine, has basically been this is required watching. You know, like you get those required reading books in school. This is everything is making sure that you watch this movie at least once in your life. Whether you own cable, whether you own nothing, they have tried to make sure that it, especially us in the millennial generation, you should have seen this movie at least once accidentally. You should have walked into your best friend's house like 1997 or something like that. Like, I don't, what are we going to do today? I don't know what's on TV. Oh, Tremors is on. What movie is this? It's a movie about worms going through the ground. But um, I do remember, actually, the first time that I saw this movie, my dad actually sat me down. This movie is one of like the, the holy movies of my family. And my dad, in, in particular, loves, for some reason, movies that involve worms because he loves Slither. It's one of his favorite. I love that movie. And Slither is a fantastic movie. You know, I it's can't been a while since we've had a James Gunn reference on this. Right. Yeah, only been like I don't know, three episodes. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was somewhere in 94 because I'm pretty sure I was in fourth grade and my dad was like, we're going to watch Tremors. And I'm like, what's this movie about? And it's like, uh, these things are underground and uh, they they sense sound. And I'm like, OK, sounds cool. I sat down and I was like, yeah, that was a pretty good movie. It was funny. We all thought it was funny. My parents absolutely will rewatch this movie at least on a yearly basis, if not more. They probably will flip through channels and they will go, Tremors is on. Let's go get a drink. It's time to watch Tremors. This is how <laughs> I feel, you know, like what, when we did our like favorite movies, this is The Big Lebowski for me. The Big Lebowski is on. Holy shit, I'm going to sit down. I don't care where in the movie it is. I'm going to sit down and watch it because I love it that much. I don't personally love this movie that much, but I do. Uh, I have a lot of it burned in my memory because I've probably seen it like 60 times accidentally. And again, um, in high school, when uh, we all were watching uh, TV, because what else the fuck were we going to do? Do homework? Streaming did not exist. Gen Zers listening, I know you're there and I I, I appreciate you very much. Um, you, you're our future. I I will. I'm not being. I'm not being. Uh, I'm not being flippant about that. Actually, I really do appreciate it. But uh, we lived before streaming, and I'm not that old. I, I mean, well, no, but we had this thing called Comedy Central where you could watch the same 15 fucking movies on a rotation easily. How many times have we all accidentally watched Rocky Horror or uh, Peggy Sue Got Married, Tremors? Um, how many? Think uh, of all the other movies because uh, uh, you know the bumpers, Nate. You know the, the Joe bumpers Pesci one um, burn in your head. The Joe, yes. is the, yeah, I forget that one. Anyway, um, words are not our names are not my strong point today, apparently, which is problematic <laughs> for a film, a film critic and film historian. But yeah, you're right. This is one that everybody has kind of seen, and if you haven't, you're probably uh, a little bit younger than us. And I do think you could you could stand to to watch it. Here's the thing that I love about Tremors beyond it's, I mean, I, I think we all kind of agreed that it's biggest strength is that it's inoffensive and it is a very watchable movie. The pacing is not, is not uh, so ponderous that you, that you get bored enough that you turn off something, you know what I mean? And there's always some sort of action coming up fairly quickly. Uh, but what I absolutely love of this is the practical effects they have so here's here's what a lot of people would probably complain about now about big practical effects, especially big monster practical effects. Um, sometimes the monster, because it's made of plastic and polymers and latex, etc., sometimes it doesn't move as with as wide a range as you might want. For example, these the the worms they call them graboids. They they name them on because they have these tongues that fly out and grab you and try and pull you into the mouth. Uh, and yes, they burrow under the ground and 
punch you by vibration. They, uh, when they come out of the ground, they have this sort of multi-piece insectile jaw uh, that opens up and it looks great. But when they come out of the top, they can't move their head up and down very much, right? It's just kind of a flailing thing. Now, in the real world, we know that some animals don't have a wide range of motion that way. But when you watch a movie, you expect a fluidity to it these days. And it doesn't necessarily have that level, but it's handcrafted. It's so good. And they did a really great job with um, sort of being creative with uh, uh, having special effects at a very low budget and also that looked realistic without being difficult. For example, we get a lot of the um, Bugs Bunny tunneling effect, right? The the tremor, the worm is coming and the ground sort of um, bows up as they travel along and you get a trail of boat up and it works well. We have a couple of really cool shots that I love of the worms tunneling in, like passing through a tunnel they've carved. So it's all black and it's as though you were embedded in the dirt seeing the worm travel in darkness. Um, it And they... Here's something I'd be interested to know exactly is uh, the actual tongue parts, a lot of times, sure, they're a little stiff sometimes in because of the reasons I mentioned, but they're also very fluid, especially when they come out of the mouth. They sort of roil out of the mouth of these creatures. I wonder if sometimes they've used the effect where they've actually, instead of you know pushing the, the prosthetics out of the mouth, they've actually had them at the end point and then reeled them in and played it in reverse, which is a, a pretty common effect uh, or a pretty common method to get some complicated effects where you need uh, where you need something to start at a place that you can't get it rationally in a shot. For example, if I were to punch Tad in the nose in a uh, direct, you know, with a camera right on it, it would be too dangerous for me to throw the punch directly at Ted's face. I'm not that good. I certainly don't have any control over my depth uh, perception. Uh, but what you would do then is I would start with my fist at Tad's nose and then pull it back quickly. And then you just reverse the film. And it looks like I am slamming my fist into Tad's hair of face. Uh, if you're on YouTube watching us at Colton Classic Films, then you will see Tad's face. You won't see Jeff's face, but what you will see is a uh, a self-portrait that Jeff has done uh, today because his camera is not on uh, of himself. And it is a pretty good likeness. Um, I'll, I'll let you to enjoy that. I certainly hope that you that you appreciate the effort Jeff put into that. But anyway, I love the, I love the practical effects. I really do. They do things like um, when when the graboids go underneath wood planked walkways, the planks bur you know burst up. They do lots of things bursting through floors, bursting through walls, um, the tongue tentacles lashing out and pushing over uh, a a like a uh, a building or a, a lean to, etc. They have this really great scene, and then we'll move on to other people actually talking. This really great scene where an entire um, uh, vehicle is sucked into the ground um and is a station wagon and i'd forgotten that because obviously in future sequels um which frankly the sequels are actually all very watchable and there are a couple that are quite good what i would say is uh just as an aside if you like tremors um tremors 2 is decent i actually when i first saw it i thought it was terrible because i love tremors so much um but now watching it back i'm like oh this is very watchable and fred ward is the lead in it um but tremors 4 is fantastic. Uh, the director of this came back to do Tremors 4, I believe. And it was, um, it's actually a prequel. It is in the Old West when uh, the town of Perfection uh, was actually called something else. It's very, very cool. I definitely recommend watching it. It has lots of callbacks to this movie. They do a good job doing callbacks all the way. And like I said, except for the first two movies, Bert, the, uh, the militaristic gun nut played by Michael Gross is the lead character and he does a great job. Okay. So some great scenes, uh, that, that station wagon eating scene I mentioned, apparently it was supposed to be different a little bit. They were supposed to, um, uh, cause the, the woman in the scene is getting sucked in inside the car and apparently she's supposed to kick out the windshield, climb out and then still fall into the hole, but they were having lots of problems and they were running out of night. So they were like, we can't do any more takes and still have the night light. Right? It's going to be daytime. So they just went ahead with the vehicle getting sucked in. And honestly, I think it's better. Um, the way it worked this way. It was more focused on the insanity of a car getting sucked into the ground than um, a person trying to escape these monsters. 
So, Jeff, if you had a standout moment, and yes, everybody, there's spoilers here, but they're not spoilers. We're just telling you what happens. Watch the movie. Seeing the movie of any kind is not the same as listening to us talk about it, right? Jeff, do you have like a standout moment, good or bad, from this movie? Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe the part where they were using the sticks to mm. like pull vault between stones. Mm. It's kind of like a fun, like old school uh uh kind of very 90s and 80s type so uh, scene um but yeah i mean I, I i mean i think the 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 thing that i get from this movie is probably very similar to what you is with the the special effects we're ne- i mean back in 1990 this this movie was made for 10 million which is like kind of like a low end on the budget like mm-hmm. the really high budget films were like 60 ish like you're talking like die hard 2 and um some of the other films um that that you've heard of uh from that year um so it is kind of like lower budget but like you know even today that'd be like around like 20 million no nobody's gonna make a movie that looks like this for 20 million dollars because they'd be the investors would be like yeah we're not we're not giving you that much money for this Mm -hmm. uh you know 90 schlock uh (laughs) and uh you know, and, and that's kind of sad in a way, but like, you know, we have all these like fun things to go back and like look at, you know, what it yeah. was like for them to do special effects in this time period, uh, you know, with what they're doing. And like, you know, they, they did like a lot of really cool stuff and like they they made it look pretty good for like what they had to work with. Like it was all very, very practical and they were doing like, you know, puppetry out of, you know, dirt um, and, uh, you know. I, I, uh, that, that's kind of the thing that I'm watching for when I'm watching mm-hmm. it. I'm not really like, you know, the, you know, the narrative isn't like drawing me in, in any way. Like, you know, I'm getting a little nostalgia from seeing like Kevin Bacon again. Um, but like, it, it's really just like, I'm like looking at the scenes and being like, oh yeah, how did they do this? How did they do that one? Um, cause they, they, they come up a little bit more. I wouldn't say I wouldn't like the the way that special effects are done today. I wouldn't say they're easy because like they're just challenging in a different way. Right. But you know what I mean? It was like like every little thing was thought out, um, mm-hmm. at least in a different way back then. And so it's a really cool to kind of like try and work that puzzle backwards. And a lot of um, things, a lot of things could go wrong. More things could go wrong when you're ex- when you're exclusively using practical effects, right? Yeah. Because you can fix a lot in post with 3D effects, even if even if it's a physical stunt, say, you can clean it up, right? Yeah. But a physical thing, Jaws is, of course, the famous perfect example, right? The, the animatronic shark never worked. So this big, expensive thing they did that they constantly couldn't get to work, they ended up cutting out a lot of the footage and just kind of um, the act of doing that actually improved the tension, right? So yeah. It's, you have to work with what you have and well, what I mean, that, that is that is kind of like another thing and almost that's that stayed in even though like modern films have uh again now we're not going to say easy or inexpensive because mm-hmm. like you know the artists and stuff still are doing great work and uh sure uh, you know doing really creative stuff but it's you know when you're building this big thing for just one scene you mm-hmm. know this big animatronic for one scene uh <laughs> you know that's a a, a very clear cost and a difficulty. Um, and so a lot of these films back then, they really try and avoid showing their monster. Like the, like yeah. the scene where like the, the dude doing the, the jackhammer into like the, uh, the tar or the, the yeah, 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 whatever asphalt. The, the asphalt. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, you get like this, like blood kind of bubbling up, and then the, you know, he gets kind of dragged off. We don't see the monster at all during this like entire scene, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's and like you said with like Jaws, like not showing it is sometimes just like way better than showing it. Um, and you know, you can see that in kind of modern cinema that they almost learned because, uh, you know, these uh, movies were made in like the you know. Uh, the past that mm. we're doing it just for budget constraints and not wanting to show, uh, you know, all of their stuff right off at the beginning, you know, like you gotta, you gotta kind of save your big, big moments, um, for, for later in your film. So they have more impact. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that I, you can actually kind of see that in um, like, what do we do underwater? Um, like you actually don't see the big monster that much and it, no. and, it, and it's, you know, it is generally pretty grainy and stuff. Um, and I think that's good. And I think that's learned from the past. So I think you can see like a lot of the um, uh, kind of the throughput of, of, of this learning and, and how uh, filmmaking um, uh, has been done um, and how it relates to today in this film. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, I, I think it's, it's worth saying that the um, if anybody's wondering, like, yeah, OK, this sounds like you like it, but why would I like it? The the script is written um, by a writing team, uh, S.S. Uh, Wilson and um, Brennan uh, Maddock, Brent Maddock, excuse me. And he uh, they both have written a lot of successful movies, as well as some that maybe weren't so successfully adapted, such as uh, Wild West with um will smith but they also wrote short circuit they wrote batteries not included which we covered on this very pod several years ago they wrote uh, some interesting ones they wrote ghost dad with uh with uh, professional rapist bill cosby bill cosby they wow. they um they they they've written many many successful films and uh those of you who are fans of short circuit uh interesting movie that i found depressing they are doing a a, a reboot soon no. so well no. you know maybe this one won't have a dead dad god anyway uh so and as far as kevin bacon's just to give some background on this kevin bacon had been acting a lot of people say this was his breakout that's not quite accurate uh he he his first film i believe was an animal house uh in 78 then he went to he did he did lots of films and tv appearances but his next big one was probably Mm, oh, uh, Friday the 13th in 80. And then he actually had a lead in Footloose uh, in 1986, I think it was. I was going to say, wait a minute. And then, oh, yes. Footloose. And then this film in 1990 was the next bigger one. And this film was actually not successful in its theatrical run, um, it, which was unfortunate. I don't know, you know, who knows why, but it hit in a year that lots of big things happened. The Ninja Turtles film, the first, you know, live action Ninja Turtles film happened. Um, there were just many, many features that sort of eclipsed I mean, it. Yeah, there's some good like high budget action films that came out yeah, that year. Very that, much, you know, you got to compete with. And interestingly, I mean, though, the film became very successful because uh, of the video rental circuit. In fact, it made over three times its its I think first year video rental, uh, or maybe its complete run. But before or, or then it made it its theatrical run. So it became it was one of those things that it was very clear right away that it was going to be a cult classic, um, which then led, of course, to its success for similar reasons on television uh fans and fiends out there this film is not streaming uh easily uh i think apple might have auctioned it or optioned it to stream on apple plus um, but i'm not sure I, I actually think i saw that i still had to pay for it so anyway but it's worth renting it's worth purchasing i'm looking forward to a full hd release of the series that would be nice but this movie especially would 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 be great to have a 4k release um especially with some new features maybe talking to kevin bacon because kevin bacon had a very tumultuous relationship with this film he actually refused to talk about it um after it was a box office bomb he said it was the worst he was quoted as saying uh essentially it was the worst mistake of his life he thought at the time that it was going to end his career uh and then years and years have gone by and and he started to speak differently about it he said um in the most the more recent interviews he said you know it was actually it was partially disappointing because it was actually the most fun i've ever had making a movie and he said that he was he said it was a very bad time in his life and so he was very negative about it and he said however this is what I thought was interesting he says that he he usually only watches his movies once and many of them he's never watched and he has no desire to he said but i have watched tremors dozens of times uh, and I actually really love it now. So it's interesting to see how things change for people who actually are making the film because we only see we only see the product. We don't see the actual process of making the movie, which is why something like um, Tarantino and Rodriguez's sort of pseudo documentary uh, about um, about uh, why is my brain doing this and dead. Um, 
their vampire movie with George Clooney. Sweet Lord. Uh, anyway, uh, why Full Tilt Boogie was so interesting. We kind of see a little bit more, we imagine a little bit more of what it's like to actually put together something like this. And as Jeff, as you said, it is considered a small budget studio film um, and probably would be considered smaller now, even with inflation. I, I think, you know, movies have become more expensive, uh, but <clears throat> it was considered relatively small. And so to have this sort of staying power, uh, it really, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's something they should be proud of. Um, but as I said, this was written by the writing pair, as well as the director, the director of this film, Ron Underwood has made many, many movies we've all seen and loved probably a few we haven't loved still, still working. So the pedigree behind this film, uh, is strong behind the camera, at least for, you know, entertaining you know, I don't want to say B features because we tend to think of B features as actually much, much smaller features, uh, but it's it's got something behind it. It's not a nothing. These aren't new people to the game. They've been doing this for a long time. So that's why this film is very competently shot. Tad, uh, let's pass the question that I asked Jeff. Are there any standout scenes in this movie that you always think about? Good scenes, bad scenes? Yes. Anything like that? Yes. Um, and it, it sounds obvious, but the pretty much the climactic scene where they defeat one of the worms by using the the, the I want to say the pipe bombs. Mm -hmm. They look like pipe bombs. It's dynamite sticks, but they look like pipe bombs, right. um, which actually because you made the Bugs Bunny reference, which I always thought of when they were digging through yeah. the ground. It would be so much funnier if they just use sticks of dynamite, just throw dynamite. Um but yes, that scene where they're they're tricking it and they I don't actually understand. Like I've rewatched that scene so many times and I really don't understand how they trick the worm this way, but they you know what the it's at the end. They're luring it to the edge of the cliff. And then they throw the dynamite behind it. And that's supposed to trick it into going through the cliff. It, it's not and supposed like, to trick I, it. It's it blows it forward. Is that how it works because they threw it above ground yes i believe so that, that doesn't Do you make agree, sense Jeff? Nathan. I, I so that was one interpretation i had uh i wasn't 100 percent clear that's what it was but that was like my first thought my second thought was it was a distraction so like it created uh it wasn't paying attention to where it's going it wasn't and paying that, attention to where I, it was going. i get that too and it, frankly, it doesn't fucking matter because the point is, is that they go, hey, wait, these things can't see. And they're stupid enough that they might go through. And they were like, oh, good. It worked. And that thing flying out the side of the cliff and falling and then splatting. And then the, this movie is viscerally impressive in terms of like how its special effects work. Like you you love the practical effects and you didn't somehow mention all the all the guts the goo, and and the, and, and the, goo in, the ketchup like, and usually it looks like um spaghettios through yeah, all the series it looks like spaghettios that are it, it comes out of it it's and really they make it supposed to stink so it always gives the actors a nice thing to react to yes i, yeah, I like I, that spaghettios thing because it's like <laughs> not red right it's like it's got that kind of like kind of yellowish red Right, kind of the orange. Yeah. You're like, oh, is this tomato yeah. sauce? They're like, it's orange. Just, it's just orange enough sauce. to just enough to make it n feel like it's not of this planet, almost. With, almost with insectoid, like right? Yeah, that's um, a goo that doesn't come out of something that's normal. Like you've squished bugs, Nate. You know that that's not the color that comes out of bugs when you squish them. I have done much penance for squishing bugs as a child. As uh, have we all. Yes. We have all repented, but still, you know what bug squish looks like. Unfortunately, point being is that. Um, when it hits the ground, it's really funny. Even as a kid, I went, uh, my brain just went, that bug was really heavy because it just just goes and the, it and it just, like the gravity itself. Out. Like it was like it, you you can tell that there was a lot of heft behind that thing. But I I even to this day, that scene really stands out to me because it's gross, but at the same time, it's not like nauseating. It's not boxers omen because I love going back to that viscerally yep. like reprehensible when you watch it it's just like ew squished bug and that's about yes. as much as you get and then you're like ah that was pretty cool yeah i i think i think you kind of hit the nail on the head with it doesn't quite matter what the actual purpose of throwing the dynamite was which is why i don't think they even bother telling us because <laughs> i can never focus on anything but that great explosion of rock when the giant worm bursts fully out of the the side of the cliff and then hits the ground like it's it's 
it is the centerpiece moment. Um, and, you know, it's one of those scenes that I think has actually been kind of pulled for many other features thereafter mm -hmm. uh, of different different types. So mm -hmm. it's there's a reason why it's it's remembered fondly. Well, OK, so uh, we talked about this movie. I think Jeff kind of hit on this as well. It's not a complicated film. Um, and in some ways, that's a lot better to me when you get to a movie that has some sort of it's it's a it's a monster movie but it's supposed to be based in the real world right uh, a lot of times they get so hung up in explaining the science that they've developed behind it you know midichlorians etc that it is it's boring and also it takes away some of the mystery if you're being attacked in the desert by a monster no one's ever heard of or seen before then you're not going to be like i found out where it's from blah 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 yeah, you know care. and they have a scientist but she's a she's like what a seismologist so it's not like she's a biologist right yeah. so she gives some some initial theories that any of us would come up with probably and uh and it's it's believable it's not like they you know it's like, oh, they they they're from before time was recorded. Oh, I think they're aliens. You know, by the way, they 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 still never really address this in most of the sequels. But uh, I think they're aliens. It doesn't make any sense. I they're do not too. In the fossil record. They got to be aliens. And they are. Uh, they are most certainly. And by the way, before I forget, Nate, I almost forgot that I uh, when I was rewatching this for I don't know the sixty seventh time. I'm sure <laughs> um, this movie feels like the most expensive mst3k movie that was ever made and tom servo doesn't need to narrate it because you're doing it the entire time you're watching it it's That's... that this is this is that kind of movie where you are just thinking how silly it is and you're still enjoying it but yeah. how you know i've watched so much mst3k mm -hmm. and it just kind of fits in that but at the same time it's always just a step above right this movie like, like we've been talking about this movie just fits a certain space that no other movie does, which is probably why it has been, like I said, shoved by the machine. It fit a space that no one knew needed to, that it needed to fit in. It's tame sci-fi. It's highly entertaining. It's funny. It's endearing. It's just gross enough. It's it still looks great. Like the mm. movie transfer still looks fantastic. It was filmed on real stock. Real stuff. Yeah, exactly. So and the special effects, it, it's just it's the solidest B movie I could ever think of. And I don't mean B movie. I mean, like B as in not B minus, not B plus. It's just a B. It's not memorable, but you will still remember everything the moment that you go, wait a minute, Tremors. And then you see the friggin worm coming out of the side of the cliff. And you're like that movie with Kevin Bacon when he had long hair. Yep. No, yeah, it, it's it's a weird spot. So I take it then that you recommend Tremors. But this is required whom? watching. Like I said, in yes. the beginning, this is a required watch. If you are listening to this podcast, the if you have not watched this dozens of times accidentally, you better go watch it. And then you will understand everything that we've just been talking about. And I'm wondering how those of you out there who haven't seen this film and will now go see it. Uh, I'm wondering how you will experience it because it's sort of interesting. I feel like we are promoting the film and we'll talk to Jeff for his opinion shortly, but uh, I feel like we're promoting the film, but at the same time saying that it's not like peak excellence, it's somehow peak consumability. You know what I mean? Like, and, yeah. and so I wonder if yeah. you can be oversold when somebody's telling you that it's not, you know, that, that it's fun, but not like unbelievable so anyway i'm curious to hear about that so you can you can go ahead and let us know on the insta or our email etc jeff would you recommend tremors 1990 with kevin bacon fred ward michael gross reba mcintyre and tons of other wonderful people victor wong would you recommend it uh to listeners and if so why and to who uh yeah i think this one's uh a good fun watch i don't think anybody's gonna waste the hour and 30 minutes or whatever that's uh that this thing has runtime 136 yeah it's it's a fine film uh in in that um you know you'll like the characters you'll find the the premise fun uh you might give a shit when they're on the roof and it starts to collapse and you're worried about them uh but yeah it's just i, I mean to me i think the people that are really gonna like it are just like film nerds uh, mm -hmm. because it it really has 
um, that time capsule feel you like really see kind of, um, you know, not how like the crazy biggest budget film is made. Cause like, you know, when you get, get really, really up there, uh, they can really transcend their time in some cases. Uh, this is really like a 1990s film. This is like what you'd get for, uh, for a film in that period. Um, and, uh, it, it, uh, the the for me that i I love going back and just like seeing like how how they how they did it totally and i think you kind of hit on the head too that we've talked this about or we mentioned this about a, a fair number of movies that we watch and there's good reason for it this is a great movie to watch if you want to make or if you're in the process of making your own movie and you need to be inspired on how to make some effects easy but also effective because not saying that there wasn't a lot of effort like the the t- the tunnel digging effects and things like that and the ground popping up they they had effects like there were air jacks or various things doing a lot of that so it's not this is not a these are not simple things they did in the grand scheme of things but they were not complicated to the level of um say uh, even ninja turtles where they had um to do all the animatronics for the features and work so it's 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 a good it's a good place to look for inspiration uh, Jeff said that it's very, it's like a good nineties time capsule. Uh, and you're right. It's 1990. So it's also kind of that, it's that weird eighties, early middle, uh, uh, period, uh, or late middle eighties and early nineties. So the soundtrack's pretty great. Um, you've got Tanya Tucker, you have, of course, Reba McIntyre has a track on there. Um, but then you also have what, the, what is sort of touted as the main, the main song from the soundtrack is you are the one by Fahrenheit. So if that doesn't <laughs> scream 1990 to you, I don't, I don't really know what does. And of course, for me, I absolutely recommend Tremors. I just think it's a really fun movie. Uh, I, I I can watch it at any point in time. Um, and as Tad said, you're going to be narrating it in your head. If you watch it with a couple of other people and you can watch it with family, et cetera, it's not super gruesome. There's a couple of scenes maybe that there's a severed head or something, but it's not really, it's nothing is gratuitous, even except for maybe the the slobbery spaghetti score. But even that's not over the top. Um, it's just more than the rest of it. Uh, you can watch it with anyone. And uh, it's not one of those movies that takes place heavily at night, which tends to make things, I think, a little more ominous. For example, I ab- I adore Critters, but I think Critters is a little bit, it feels a little bit more adult than, say, Tremors, uh, because it's all at night. It actually can be scary. Something silly or stupid can actually be scary at night. And we don't get much of that here. It's it's bright desert day. And that somehow takes a lot of the sting out of it and moves it a little more into the action comedy than the horror element um so and like i said with family and friends you will be narrating it as you go along you'll all have something to say but at the same time as you're sort of savaging the film uh, for fun you're also really enjoying it so thank you all so much for listening to this part one episode of look out below next week we have 1990 again same year 1990 sequel film the gate Two: trespassers uh the gate the first one is which we'll quickly talk about on that episode is a uh, a cult classic of its own right with some fantastic practical effects. Um, and it's one of those movies where uh, kids get into some demonic trouble and have to uh, have to fight some some monsters. That's a long lineage of of films uh, that, you know, contribute to all sorts of contemporary things like Stranger Things. Um, most Steven Spielberg produced films now, all sorts of things. So catch us next week. And thank you all so much. I do want to give one shout out to our uh, our movie releasing. If you don't know, we do release films usually every month. Uh, these are these are low budget, out of print, special exclusive films and collector's editions that we release um, at a very good price, both through our subscription service, which you can go to at patreon.com slash cult and classic films or via our web store, which you can get at cult and classic uh, These give money directly to the hands of filmmakers. And when uh, a film doesn't have any filmmakers to claim rights, like our January release of the North Korean monster movie, uh, big monster movie, their Godzilla competitor, Polgasari, we donate it to charity. So uh, we are all about getting money to those that, that need it. Thank you all so much. Check out our stuff and listen next week for part two of this series on cult and classic films. To play us out as always is the Chud with All About Evil. Hey. 
Hey everyone, thanks for listening to Cult and Classic Podcast. This podcast is important to me, but what's more important are the rights, privileges, and freedom from violence of everyone in this country and in this world. And that means supporting Black Lives Matter. If you'd like to make a donation, please go ahead and visit cultandclassicpodcast.com where we have a list of places you can donate and help out. And please stay safe.